Two spacecrafts land on the moon, or at least tried. Rocket Lab shows its progress and innovation. The Chinese space station gets international. Starship flight test number eight of SpaceX. The manufacturing lab in space lands safely back on Earth. Europe gets hit by space debris. Launches of the week. I'm Christophe Paget from All About Space, and this is your Space Update. January 15th, SpaceX launched two moon landers, both from private companies, one from iSpace called Resilience and the other one from Firefly Aerospace called Blue Ghost. And as things come in threes, SpaceX launched on February 26th a third moon lander from the private company Intuitive Machines called IM2 or Athena. This week, the Blue Ghost lander touched down successfully on the moon at the Mare Crisium. The lander contains 10 instruments. Many of them are from NASA and valuable data is currently being captured and downlinked back on Earth. And this includes deployment of Lunar Planet Vac, the first extraterrestrial vacuum cleaner to sample lunar regolith, the deployment of the electrodynamic dust shield and demonstrating dust mitigation, capturing images from scalps for lunar plume surface studies, and several more payloads. I will not go into more details. The iSpace Resilience spacecraft will arrive on the Moon in three months from now, as it is taking a more fuel-efficient route. As for the Intuitive Machine's Athena lander, it also arrived this week Unfortunately, it did not achieve all it wanted to do. First of all, the issues the previous missions had were fixed. The craft is still working, receiving sun on its solar panels, but the intuitive machines team believe that the craft is lying on its side in the vicinity of the landing site. And they are checking if they can still use the onboard instruments, such as the drill. Intuitive machines already plans to send its third mission by early 2026, so lots of work to do in such a short time. Space is hard, moon landing is harder. Rocket Lab showed his neutron rocket fairing tests. The fairing will be permanently attached to the first stage. This fairing does look like a hippopotamus mouth. They have also shown the stage one composite tank, as you could see, and the rocket is progressing well. And it is nice to see hardware out and being all to be tested. The intention of Rocket Lab is to reuse its first stage and fairing, and therefore intends to land it in the ocean using a drone ship. Now, Rocket Lab has just released a picture of his drone ship called Return on Investment, about 120 meter or 400 feet long. It's currently undergoing customization based on an existing barge called Oceanus to support return to Earth missions. The Neutron rocket is scheduled to debut this year, according to Rocket Lab, whilst the drone ship return on investment is expected to enter service next year. But Rocket Lab did not stop here. They have just released a mock-up of their intended Internet satellite constellation to compete with the likes of Starlink or Kuiper constellations. They call it Flatelit because of its shape. So no wonder why Rocket Lab's share price has rocketed recently. Tiangong is a space station designed, built and operated by Chinese staff. However, I'm very surprised to learn that Tiangong is to host the first foreign astronaut. Now, the Pakistani government has signed a cooperation agreement with China National Space Administration and China Manned Space Program for selecting and training Pakistani astronauts, advancing collaboration in manned spaceflight. So, we will have another International Space Station soon. At Starbase in Texas, the launch site was focusing on completing the rigging of the Mechazilla arms for Tower Number 2. The flame trench is taking shape, as you could see from this aerial view. Next door, on the launch mount number 1, the Starship 34 joined its booster number 15 and was stacked up shortly before the planned flight tests. 
as the flight test was delayed, it was destacked and restacked to provide us with some entertainment. On the production site, Starship number 34 was fed with its four simulated Starlink satellites. Booster 16 was rolled out to the Massey site and carried out several cryo tests before returning to the production site for engine installation. The flight test number 8 took off from Starbase in Texas late on Thursday, the 6th of March. The rocket ascended in a similar fashion as on previous flights, such as number 6 or 7. For example, the separation occurred just under 3 minutes at 63 km altitude, using again hot staging, and the booster returned to site and was caught by the tower number one Mechazilla arms without any issues. The second stage carried on, raising his altitude to 146 km and his speed to about 20,000 km an hour. And around eight minutes in the flight, the Starship started misbehaving, where we could see the Starship rotating in space. The engine indicators showed that some engines were stopped over time and the propellant indicators were going up and down like a yo-yo. At around 9 minutes mark, the Starship was lost and suffered an explosion where we could see many fragments entering the Earth's atmosphere in the same way as for flight test number 7. SpaceX started an investigation into the cause of this explosion and I will let you know the outcome once published. Varda Space Industries is a company dedicated to manufacture pharmaceutical products in microgravity. It has designed, together with Rocket Lab, a space lab and capsule capable of manufacturing complex and expensive drugs in the vacuum of space and land back to Earth once done. Varda first launched back in June 2023 to growing crystals of Form 3 of the antiretroviral drug Rito Navir. It struggled to acquire the landing license from the FAA to bring the drug back on Earth and therefore started working with the Australian authorities to land there instead, but finally got FAA approval some six months later and landed in Utah. In January 2025, Varda sent a second pharmaceutical space laboratory and this week it landed back on Earth, but this time in Kuniba Test Range in South Australia. So it's the start of a lucrative business starting to emerge where companies no longer depend on a long waiting list to get to the ISS to carry out their research. Thanks to Varda, this can be done in relatively short notice. On February 1st, a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket took off from Vandenberg in California with onboard 22 Starlink satellites for his mission Group 11-4. Now, the first stage landed on the drone ship as it does regularly, and in fact, for the 414th time as of the 1st of March. However, SpaceX has always ensured his second stage burns up in the atmosphere at a speed of 28,000 km an hour within days of the launch to avoid leaving debris in space. However, this time, the second stage did not re-enter the atmosphere in a controlled fashion as planned, but rather uncontrollably. What happened? Well, it came down over Europe 19 days later than planned, and one composite overwrapped pressure vessel used to reignite the Falcon 9 Merlin engines fell near habitation in Poland near the city of Poznan. Luckily, no one was hurt, but this triggered an investigation of the reasons for it. This past week, SpaceX found the reasons for this issue and have already implemented mitigations for future flights, according to a SpaceX statement. It was linked to a liquid oxygen leak, which prevented a controlled re-entry. SpaceX instead passivated the second stage, removing sources of energy that could cause the stage to break up. This is typically done by venting propellant tanks and discharging batteries to avoid in-space explosion, which could have triggered a snowball effect with other potential nearby debris. Now, this is the third incident involving a Falcon 9 upper stage in a little more than six months. However, based on so far a total of 453 Falcon 9 launches, this failure rate is rather low. 
Many rocket launch providers do not purposely deorbit their first or second stages and therefore leaves atmospheric drag to do it for them in an uncontrollable fashion. March 1st, XSpace launched a Kaizu 1A rocket from China. Now we know that because notification were issued by the Chinese airworthiness authorities, but for some reason, no further information has been made aware and therefore something is fishy. I will not speculate, but there is little transparency here and it is not good news for XSpace. On March 2nd, the Russian Space Forces launched a Soyuz 2.1 with a Fregat M upper stage from Russia for his mission Cosmos 2584, which is basically the GLONASS K2 batch number 14. March 3rd, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 from Florida for a Starlink mission Group 1220. The first stage flew for its fifth time and landed successfully on a drone ship. However, shortly after, an off-nominal fire in the aft section of the rocket broke out and damaged one of the booster's landing legs, which resulted in the booster tipping over, according to SpaceX statement. And here is what is left of it. March 6th, the day started with an Ariane Espace launch of his Ariane 6 from the French Guiana for his mission CSO-3, the first European launch of 2025. And the last launch that day was that of SpaceX from Texas with his eighth flight tests of his Starship number 34 and his super heavy booster number 14, which I previously covered in length. In summary, from January 1st until March 6th, 2025, 44 rockets were launched successfully. Out of that, 29 were from an American company or institution, 9 from China, 3 from Russia and 1 from Europe. I'll leave you this week with this picture from the Hubble Space Telescope of the Water Snake Galaxy, also known as NGC 5042, in the Hydra constellation, some 48 million light years away from us. Now, the very bright white spots on the top is the single Milky Way star. The brilliant pink gas cloud are created by hydrogen atoms and are new stars being formed. The blue dots are hot stars scattered all around the galaxy. What an amazing combination of galactic clouds picked up by the Hubble very recently. Thank you for watching your channel All About Space. See you at the next episode of Space News.